And that's the way it steers, Lou. When I make a turn, the wheels don't come back to center. We'll check over the steering, Mr. Adams, and have it ready for you tonight. You boys want to come over here a minute? Sure thing. What's up, Lou? Well, I thought you fellas would like to lend a hand to correct this steering condition on Mr. Adams' car. And don't forget me. Steering conditions are right up my alley. Oh, hiya, Tech. Glad to see you. Uh, it looks like we got a misalignment condition between the steering gear housing and the steering column jacket, Tech. You can check us while we correct it. Glad to, my boy. Lead on. How do you know that misalignment is the cause of this condition, Lou? Experience, Ray. Of course, there are other causes of wheels not returning to center, but this is the most likely spot to look. Remember, this is a power steering job. And if there is misalignment, the valves won't be able to operate properly because of binding in the steering column. Therefore, the wheels won't return to center of their own accord. Now, first, we'll loosen the two screws which fasten the steering column shroud to the instrument panel and push down on the steering column shroud until the lower flanged edge of the jacket presses against the flat surface of the rubber insulator on the valve body cap. Then we tighten the shroud to instrument panel bolts and check the spacing around the jacket between the jacket and the insulator to see if it's equal. Now I'll check the spacing with this feeler gauge by inserting the gauge and checking at 90 degree intervals around the circumference of the steering column tube. Hmm, looks like I've found it. What'd you find, Lou? It's tight at the bottom. The greatest space is between the top of the jacket and the insulator. That means we'll have to lower the rear end of the gear housing assembly ray in order to align the gear housing valve body cap with the steering column. And that steering gear housing is fastened to its mounting bracket by three bolts in oversized holes. Right. Now, of course, if the spacing between the steering column jacket and the valve body cap had been uneven at the right or left side, we'd have had to move the housing and bracket in the slotted holes in the bracket to correct the alignment. Say, what if those holes weren't big enough to give enough movement of the housing on the bracket? Then what would you do? Well, in that case, we'd have to shim between the gear housing bracket and the frame. We can use U-shaped shims or plain flat washers. And then after you've corrected the alignment, tighten all bolts to specifications. And I suppose that corrects the condition, Lou. It usually does, Ray. But there are other points you should check to be sure. For example, after you've tightened all bolts to specifications, you'll have to close the gap that will have appeared between the turn signal switch and the steering wheel. To correct this condition, loosen the two screws that fasten the steering column shroud to the instrument panel and move the column jacket up until the gap is closed. Okay, Lou, what's next? Well, since the proper adjustment of the spur gears is so important to the operation of this power steering, we should check that next. Now, you both remember how the teeth of the two spur gears, the one on the end of the steering gear shaft and the one on the worm gear, mesh. Yeah, I remember that all right. Now, if there's too much play between the spur gear teeth, you may get excessive backlash in the steering wheel or a rattle on straight-ahead driving. And if those spur gears are set too tight, you'll get jumpy or erratic steering. Do we follow the same procedure that we always have for adjusting these spur gears, Lou? Yes, we do, Don. Except that now, the adjustments are made at 12 points during one complete revolution of the steering wheel. Correct, my boy. And now let's show them how to make the 12-point check of the spur gears, Lou. Right. Get in and start the engine, Don. Then, with the front wheels straight ahead, lift up the steering wheel and release it. The steering wheel drops back slowly, Lou. Good. Now, let's keep moving it about four inches at a time, or about the width of your hand, and check it each time until you've made one complete revolution. Now, let me know if the steering wheel hangs up or drops down too quick. I suppose if the wheel hung up, it would mean that the spur gears were too tight at that point. Right, Ray. And if it dropped down too quickly, it would mean that it was too loose. She hangs up right there, Lou. Okay, Don. Now, that means we'll have to move the adjusting plate slowly, counterclockwise, until the steering wheel drops back slowly. That's it. She's dropped back. Good. And now, you continue these checks until the wheel drops back slowly at the tightest point. 
That doesn't sound too difficult, Lou. Suppose you made these adjustments and the front wheel still wouldn't return as straight ahead when coming out of a turn. Well, in that case, you'd make a resistance check at the wheels. Now, the first thing you'd do would be to jack up the front wheels and start the engine. This means that your power steering is in operation. Now, grab the left front tire and turn the wheel slowly to the right. Then, pull the wheel back to the left. And notice any resistance to turning of the wheels in either direction. Right, Tech. If any turning resistance is found, you'll have to make further adjustment of the steering gear housing on its mounting bracket. Now, here's how to do it. Scribe a line across the bracket and gear housing. This line will be your guide as to how much the housing moves during adjustment and to relocate the housing should the adjustment prove excessive. Now, lower the front wheels to the floor with the wheels straight ahead and loosen the three bolts that fasten the gear housing to the bracket just enough to permit movement. Then start the engine again. If, for example, there was resistance when turning the front wheels from left to right, turn the steering wheel one quarter turn to the left and tighten the bolts while Ray holds the steering wheel. The housing moved on the bracket, Lou. Good. Now, tighten the bolts down and we'll check resistance again. Same as we did before. Hmm. Got resistance in the opposite direction now. Well, that means we'll have to move the housing half the distance between where it is now and the scribed line and then road test it to be sure we have it right. If there isn't enough movement in the bolt holes to permit this adjustment, place a shim under the front or rear of the mounting bracket between the bracket and the frame. What's the story on alignment as far as conventional steering is concerned, Lou? Oh, it's about the same as power steering alignment, Ray. But first, I better tell you that there are two methods of mounting the steering gear assembly on the frame. On the top and on the side. Now, let's talk about top mounting first. To align the steering column with the gear housing, first loosen the bolts that attach the gear housing bracket to the frame and the two bolts which fasten the steering column to its support bracket on the instrument panel. Then shift the steering gear housing in the oversized holes until all strain is removed from the steering column. And don't forget, somebody has to hold the steering column in the correct position at the instrument panel. That's right, Tech. Then, when you have it properly aligned, tighten the attaching bolts. Then the steering column should line up freely with the bracket at the instrument panel so you can fasten it in place. Now, sometimes tightening the gear housing bracket to the frame throws the column out of line with the instrument panel bracket. If that happens, you'll have to put shims between the frame and the mounting bracket to line it up so you can tighten the bolts and keep the column in line with the instrument panel bracket. And after you've made these adjustments, road test the car to make sure you've corrected the condition. That's a good point, Tech. And another good point is for somebody to turn this record over. On the side of the frame-mounted gear housing, no provision is made for sideways adjustments. However, the housing can be adjusted up and down by loosening the three bolts which hold the housing to the frame and moving the assembly. The housing will pivot around the upper bolt. Tell them about those washers, Lou. Yeah, good idea, Tech. Uh, Tech is talking about the washers on the two lower mounting bolts. You see, there are spacers over the mounting bolts. These spacers control the fore and aft alignment of the gear housing and also control the compression of the rubber insulator. Now, the oversized holes where the two lower mounting bolts go through the housing are larger than the spacers. Therefore, the spacers could be drawn into the holes when the mounting bolts are tightened. So washers are put over the two lower bolts. When the bolts are tightened, the spacers butt against the washers. That maintains housing alignment and prevents over-tightening, which would destroy the effect of the insulator. And if you ever remove the gear housing, be sure those washers are in place over the two lower bolts. If you leave them out, you'll pull the housing out of line when you tighten the bolts. Now remember, hard shifting may result from any of these steering alignment conditions and may cause some of the moving parts in the shift linkage to become bent. So you better check the operation of this linkage after you've corrected the misalignment condition just to be sure the transmission shifts easily. Say, Lou, 
Why don't you tell the boys about that hard shifting you sometimes get on 1953 Chryslers, DeSotos, and Dodges equipped with hydraulic transmissions? Mm, let's see. That's when the select delivers at the transmission housing get out of adjustment. Right, Lou. Well, first, before you do anything else, check the linkage to see that there are no binds. Then, if there are no binds, check the selector lever for adjustment. Just how do those selector levers work, Lou? Well, very simply, Don. Anytime you move the gear shift lever at the steering wheel, either up or down, the selector lever at the transmission moves also. Now, this selector lever actually consists of two levers fastened together at their upper ends by a bolt and nut and a spacing sleeve. The inner selector lever pivots on a steel shaft, which extends through the gear shift housing into the transmission. A coil spring, which fits over the spacing sleeve, has two spring hooks, which snap over the two levers and keep them from rotating separately. Now, at the lower end of the outer selector lever, you'll find a lug containing an adjusting screw, which extends forward contacting a lug on the lower end of the inner selector lever. Now, as the bottom of the outer selector lever is pulled forward by the selector rod, the adjusting screw picks up the inner lever, moving it forward. If this adjusting screw is not set correctly, the forward travel of the inner selector lever will not be correct, and hard shifting into reverse will result. Key wreck, my boy. And if the tension of the coil spring is too weak, the inner selector lever will not return fully to its original position when the outer selector lever moves back. This will result in hard shifting into the forward ranges. Right, Tech. To adjust these selector levers, first disconnect the selector rod from the outer selector lever and back out the adjusting screw until its end is flush with the lug on the outer selector lever. Now, check the tension of the outer selector lever spring. The tension of the spring should be enough to hold the outer lever firmly against the inner, with the selector rod disconnected. And if it doesn't, the spring is weak and should be replaced. Now, to be doubly sure the inner lever will return to its original position, add a new selector lever return spring. This is a coil spring which should be hooked over the sleeve at the upper end of the selector levers, and then fastened to the transmission gear shift housing. And if the car has a torque converter, the forward end of this spring should be fastened under the head of the upper forward bolt on the transmission gear shift housing. Right, Tech. If the car does not have a torque converter, hook the forward end of the spring through the hole in the raised boss on the housing. Better tell them how to adjust those selector levers with the adjusting screw, Lou. Right. Now, after you've checked the outer selector lever spring, it should be unhooked from both levers so that they're free. But leave that new coil spring hooked in place to hold the levers in the proper position. Then, reconnect the selector rod to the outer selector lever and move the gear shift control lever to the rear until the gears are fully meshed in drive range. Now, turn the adjusting screw in until the screw end just contacts the lug on the inner selector lever and tighten the lock nut. And remember, turn that screw in just until it makes contact with the inner lever. If you turn it too far, you'll have difficult shifting, too. Right, Tex. Now, reconnect the spring over the arms of both levers in their correct positions. And finish up the job by moving the gear shift lever through all the shift ranges to make sure the transmission shifts properly. Say, Lou, take a look at the gasoline stains on the stone shield of your car. Hmm? Hey, I better check that right away. What could be causing that, Lou? Well, it uh, it could be several things, Don. It may be that the filler cap gasket is not making a good seal. Or the sealing surface of the filler neck may be uneven, so the gasket can't make a good seal. And it might be that gasoline is leaking out between the collar and the end of the filler neck. First, check the cap gasket. If it isn't making a good seal, install a larger and thicker gasket. That new gasket part number is in the reference book, Ray. Good. But suppose the gasket is all right. Well, then we'll check the sealing surface of the filler neck to see if it's smooth so the gasket can seat properly. The first thing to do is remove the filler neck from the car. 
Just loosen the clamp which holds the neck to the rubber hose, remove the tank vent hose, and pull the filler neck from the body panel. If the sealing surface of the filler neck is rough or uneven, smooth it off by rubbing it on a piece of emery paper placed on a surface plate. Then you'll have a good flat surface for the cap gasket to seal against. Don't forget to check for leaks around that collar, Lou. No, I won't, Tex. I'll plug the tank vent and hold my finger over the little vent hole. Then I'll fill the neck with water. Fill it up so you'll get enough pressure to make a good test. Right, Tex. If water leaks out around the collar joint, it'll have to be resoldered. Then we'll test it again. Now, this one's tight, Ray, so you can reinstall the filler neck. Be sure you position that neck in the rubber hose so the little vent hole is out in the open. If you get it under that body panel grommet, you'll have no way to vent the tank. Yeah, that's important, Ray. You see, the cap isn't vented. So if that vent hole in the filler neck is covered up, the tank will develop a partial vacuum. Why not install a vented cap? If you do, it'll leak. You can't use a vented cap on the 53 models, Don. Now, while we're here, I'd like to point out the floor panel joints. If dust or moisture gets into the luggage compartment, you'll have to check the ceiling at these points. In addition to the wheel housing weld, pay particular attention to the seams of the panel over the gas tank filler neck. Seal all those joints with body sealer, Ray, and you won't have to worry about having a good, tight luggage compartment. Well, fellas, I, I guess that about winds things up. I certainly learned things about steering column alignment I didn't know before. Me too. Glad you dropped him when you did, Tech. Think nothing of it, me boy. Just remember, steering is one subject every mechanic should know from A to Z. It ranks right alongside of brakes from a safety angle. And don't ever forget, your customers look to you for safe, dependable performance from their cars. You've got an important job. <laughs>